Good morning again. We are here to present the State of the District Part 2 for you today. Um, I did speak with Ms. Bryant during the break um, regarding, you know, I want to make sure that we are cognizant of your lunchtime <laughs> and, you know, breaks and so forth during the presentation. So I spoke with Ms. Bryant and basically when my part is done, we can kind of see what the time is and if you'd like to break for lunch and then we can come back after that and um, continue, that is fine. Uh, so we'll see where we're at. So I mean, of course, we don't know what triggers questions and so forth. So it's hard to say um, how long each section will be exactly. How many presenters are there? Altogether, well, what we have here is when you see here, we got um, the math and science data and other data is myself. The district initiatives are together with um, Mr. Roland and Mr. Hebert. The how does it look in action is going to be um, how does our math look with Ms. Tidwell, and then how does our science look with Mr. Crowley. And then technology is going to be a combination of our Tectosis and Dr. Geddes. And then student services with um, Kit and Regina, and then ESC is going to be with Ms. Kirby. Okay. All right. So today we are concentrating on the math and science data. We remember in September we talked about the ELA and social studies specifically. So today we're talking about math and science, and we're also going to touch on other data as well, including our um, advanced placement, um, our IB program, industry certification, <coughs> enrollment, ACT and SAT data as well. So the what and the why is what we begin with. And here basically I just have some, some kind of highlights that we want to definitely touch base on. 79 representing our four-year grad rate, our district grad rate. Um, and that's 2% increase than the previous year. Um, that's definitely a plus. 15,960 number of students from elementary to adult that we had in 2016-17 in Citrus County Schools. I know I shouldn't do this, but your 79 was your grad rate? Grad rate. No, sorry. Um, do you have your non-dropout rate later on here? Because yeah. Oh, you know what? No, it's not on there. Okay. And the only reason why I'm, why I'm just bringing that up is because 79 is not the whole story. Absolutely, it's not. <coughs> and it we are far better than 79. It just happens to be that that's the uniform graduation rate. Correct. It includes other things like certificate of completion and so forth that you know that really are out of our hands. But you know they did complete school, right. um, and they, that is also part of that. You're correct. And that's why we've looked at those as completer programs. And when we look at all of our completer programs. Mm -hmm. We are at, I believe, over 95% of our students are completing their programs, their graduation, and they're correct. moving on right. to be successful in post-secondary. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's tried, but that one, they, they, they're not going to budge on that one. But yes, sir. So, I'd, anyway. I'd put it on there anyway. There's a, there's a lot of non-budge. It is now. <laughs> All right, before the seven. This is regarding our math success. Out of the 67 districts in Florida, the four <coughs> represents that we are fourth, we are ranked fourth for our middle school algebra data, and we are ranked seventh out of the 67 districts for our fifth grade math data. So All our right. scores in both of those, so we're very proud of that. Oh, I didn't realize it had that stuff going on. All right, six and eight <coughs> represent our science success. We, we ranked sixth in the state for our biology scores, and we ranked eighth in the state for our fifth grade science scores. So again, very, very proud of our math and science data there. And then finally, the number five represents we are fifth in the state out of 67 districts for our IB program. All right. And that is regarding the participation um, percentage. And mind you, the, the four that are above us are like Sarasota, St. John's. You're talking about very different um, <laughs> demographics of these counties, and we are right there with them with our with our success of our IB program. And we were actually at a presentation at the state, and we were asked, you know, Citrus County, why, you know, what, what do you attribute that, you know, success to? And one of the major components is you know, Mr. Bittner over at that Lacanto High yes, School really does a phenomenal yes, job with the program. So we definitely want to recognize that. Correct. Oh, yes. So when we look at our district grade again here, um, we 
we've talked about this already last time, so I'm not going to go over each component again, but just highlighting just the math and the science, like we said, are going to be the two main pieces that we are going to be concentrating on. In achievement-wise, we went from a 61% scoring three and higher on all of our math <coughs> scores to 64. And remember, that includes grades third through eighth grade math, and then it includes Algebra 1 EOC, Geometry EOC, and the Algebra 2 EOC for that school year. In our learning gains, we did increase by 3% in our math scores. And then our learning gains at the bottom quartile, we increased by 2% at that 46%. Our science, we went up 1%, 61 to 62. In our science data, and remember our science data includes our fifth grade science, eighth grade science, and our biology EOC. We're not going to have um, Algebra 2 anymore? Correct. Good. This school year, there's no more Algebra Well, we have stuff, of course. We don't have the Algebra 2 EOC anymore. So that will no longer be part of our math okay. data in our, in our grades. Okay. And then, of course, when you look all the way to the right, you see the acceleration success. And that includes our AP, IB, dual enrollment, industry certification data that we will be also touching on today with our other data um, for, the, for the district. Ms. Crown, maybe late today, can you just, on those uh, one, two, three, four numbers, or, or those numbers, could you just send us those numbers with what you stated to us? Oh, why is and that? And just so that we have those talking points to so we need those. Yeah. Those. You got it. Thank you. So starting with our elementary <clears throat> math, what I also did, at, um, you'll notice a gold star in the corner of some of these slides, and just basically reiterating if that um, subject area, if we ranked in the top 10, I wanted to note it for the state. So this was another one, fifth grade math, we did rank seventh in the state. So again, that's the t in the top 10 of 67 districts. So this, this chart though is talking about third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade together in all of our elementary schools. The blue is our district, the state is the gray. Um, so as you can see, we are definitely high above the district, I mean above the state with 69% of our third, fourth, and fifth graders scoring three and higher, and it was the same as we had last year. In our secondary math, this is again grade six through eight math test, and our Algebra one Geometry and Algebra two EOC. Again, you have the state is in the gray. We are above the state with 61% scoring three and higher, which is high, and as you can see in 2015, we were 57, we increased by 1% last year, and we increased even by more than that this year. So we are definitely going in the right direction with our secondary math scores when looking at three, scoring three and higher. We get no credit for, you know, if they are taking um, pre-calc, calc. Because those, those are not state tested. But that's what I'm saying, so we get, there's no points for our students' success in any of those types of advanced maths. Unless it's an AP. Unless it's an AP or an IB course. Mm -hmm. For dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's exactly my point. <clears throat> right, for the dual enrollment twice. Right, for the dual enrollment twice, but our kids that are doing high achieving maths, don't you know, they don't get credit unless it's. But those kids that are doing the high achieving math did take, they were part of the algebra, geometry, and possibly algebra 2 data before. But right. So were the ones that were algebra 1 and algebra 2. Right, right, <laughs> absolutely. No, but there is not a state test. I mean, obviously the only things that are in the school grade or district grades are things that are state tested. Which goes back to, by the way, when legislators say that it's not all about the test. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, when looking at just our math EOCs, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2, here you see the gray bar is our district prior year's data. The blue is our current district data, and then the, the greenish one all the way to the right is the state. And again, we want to recognize that our middle school algebra scores ranked fourth in the state out of 67 districts, so of course we're proud of that. So as you can see, our Algebra 1 scores, we stayed the same at 61% compared to the previous year. However, both Geometry and Algebra 2, we increased from the previous year and went beyond the state average. And again, we are not doing Algebra 2 EOC anymore, so you will not be seeing that data um, as part of this starting this year. But we won. We did do well. <laughs> we did better. We did better than the previous year. I shouldn't say, well, we did better. <laughs> okay, then we've got the closing achievement gap. This is very similar to the charts that we talked about last month. However, we were talking about ELA specifically with it. And this is where we are comparing different subgroups 
and looking at the gap of percentage points over time. So, of course, this is where we want the smaller bar. The smaller the bar, the better it is. Remember, that's why we put that thing all the way to the right. The higher the bar, it goes into the red. So, you know, a lot of times we look at bar graphs, you gotta kind of shift your brain to like now look at this differently. So we want a smaller bar here. And so when you look at our African-American scores versus our students that are um, white scores, you see that we have a 26% current gap in our math data, which you know, is higher than the previous year of a 20% gap. Then you see the um, state average, we are better than the state average, because again, we want to have a lower bar. So we are below the state. In Hispanic versus white, we are significantly below the state, which is great. When you look at our e, um, ED, which is economically disadvantaged versus our non-economically disadvantaged subgroup, you see that we are lower than the previous year, which is good, and significantly lower than the state. Please note that at the very bottom, we did put the N, meaning like the total number of students we are talking here. So like when you're looking at, for example, going back to like African-American versus white, how many students were part of this math data from third to eighth grade math, we took algebra one, geometry, or algebra two, as you can see, those numbers down there. So you kind of have an idea of, you know, we're talking about percent, what, how many students we're talking. <coughs> um, then you've got your ELL versus our non-ELL in math. So we did increase a little bit there compared to the previous year, which, you know, of course, we don't want to go in that direction, but we still are below that state average. And then finally, <coughs> our students with disabilities. We saw this also as a trend in our ELA data and social studies data, if you remember last, last month, where our gap is higher than the state average gap. So we want to definitely be looking at that and um, honing in on that and seeing the why and what can we do about that to decrease that gap. When looking at our learning gains, math learning gains over time, this is all students. Um, as you can see, elementary is the blue, the gold is the middle schools, and the green is the, are the high schools. And this includes all of our math and EOCs together. So these were our learning gains. And you see our district is that 59, which is above the state average of 54. And then of course the learning gains of the bottom quartile. Here again, you see the state average is a 44 and our district average is a 46. And again, it's the same color coding for each individual school, um, whether it be elementary, middle, or high. Now, when looking at our science, we just first look at our fifth grade science only. This is where our fifth grade did rank eighth in the state. Which, again, very proud of that for our science scores. Remember, we are talking about a different group of kids each year taking this test, because it's only the fifth grade that we're looking at here. So last year's fifth graders are the gray bar. This year's fifth graders are the blue bars for each school. As you can see, our district is at a 62%. And if you notice also, every single one of our elementary schools is higher than that state average of 51%. Then when you look at our eighth grade science, um, Again, all four of our middle schools did score um, either equal or above the state average of 48% of a three or higher. And again, our, the gray bar is the last year compared to this year is the blue bar. Our biology, which ranks sixth in the state out of 67 districts. As you can see, all of our high schools scored higher than that state average of 63%. Um, AES is included in this one. They did give the biology EOC with the 91% um, three and higher. And then you can see uh, the rest of the schools there and how they compare to last year to this year. If you notice, our three high schools, Lacanthus, <coughs> Citrus, and Crystal River High, all actually improved from the previous year with the biology scores. Remembering also it's a different group of kids, we know, but that we did um, increase there. And then when you look at the achievement gap with our science, you see again, um, we are lower than the state, which is a good thing in all of the subgroups, except the last two, that ELL versus non-ELL. We are above that state average, which again, we want to you know, hone in on that, and why is that? We know, of course, ELL students, um, you know, they, are, they are not English speakers, and there is a lot of times reading involved in our science assessments. So you know that does play a piece in it, and they do not receive that accommodation of read to um, when reading's not assessed, 
like some other student, other accommodations are for IEPs and so forth. So that is a piece that we want to look at. But we also have to remember all ELL students statewide receive the same accommodations, okay, or could receive the same accommodations. Students with disabilities, again, even though we are a better a better gap than we were two years ago, we are still above that state average, though. What defines the difference between Hispanic and ELL? Okay, ELL, well, I mean, you could be Hispanic, but you are an English speaker. If you are an ELL student, that means that you are, English is not um, your first language, however, you also do not pass, um, they, do a, they do a screener, of course, if you have that checked off on your registration, that you know English is not the first language or, or something like that, and then they, they screen you, and if you are struggling with reading and, and so forth, if your scores show that on that test, you then receive ELL services mean like you know that you are being taught English so that you can succeed you know more so but you can definitely be the majority of our Hispanic students are not ELL students where they are struggling readers of the English language are the majority of our ELL students though of a Hispanic speaking yes I mean Hispanic definitely is our our uh, if you would put them all our, our, our dominant one but I'm going to tell you we have a lot a lot of different languages and I know that from the research capability world where one of the accommodations is with testing, they can receive a word-to-word -word dictionary. And so we have to purchase special word-to-word -word dictionaries that are allowed, allowed for testing, and the amount of the different languages that we are now really like, you know, having to purchase for, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing just the, the different cultural backgrounds that our, our students are coming from. It's just interesting that our Hispanic group population is doing so predominantly very, very well, mm -hmm. um, but our necessary. ELL being predominantly Hispanic is not doing as as well. It was just right. But you also look at the number. We have we had two hundred sixty six students right. who took either a fifth grade, eighth grade science or biology, but only twenty students are ELL. Right. And again, of those twenty students that are ELL, maybe you know eight of them might be Hispanic. Jim saying, and the rest be the different different languages. Okay. Now shifting over to our other data, when you look at advanced placement. All of our high schools offer advanced placement courses. Um, here you see some trends are from past years, 2015 to the current year, so it goes from left to right. And then the district is all the way to the right, so you can see there that the number of past AP tests we have increased each year, starting with 535 in 2015 to now we had this year 560 AP past tests. So, of course, remember when the students pass an AP test, that does contribute to our acceleration piece of our district and school grades as well. It also counts as college credit for the student when they pass that AP test. So it is a very important thing. It does not count towards the student's grade, however, the AP test. So this is purely for that student to be able to benefit from having that college credit um, by passing it. So underneath each uh, category down there you see more data where you can see actually the number of total tests taken and then the percent passed. So when you look at our district as a whole, we did have more passed tests with 560 versus 551 last year. However, our percent passed stayed the same because we also had more tests taken um, than the previous year as well. So we have 31% pass rate with our AP test. And as you can see, we have increased the number of past tests each year for the past three years. And I just need to remind our board and, and those listening that that 1810 number of, of AP tests taken has also been equated to that even if a student gets a one or a two, when when we had the Gates Foundation here, we were look, we were able to look at the longevity of that data. It showed that our students that just took an AC exam and course that 65% of them did not require interventions in college because they learned how to take rigorous courses and study in our high schools. We have an open enrollment policy in our Based district. I am very supportive of that because the proof has really been in the results. Absolutely. Now, in the top corner, as you know, like we do receive funds for past AP tests. Um, teachers get bonuses, schools get money, district gets money, and approximately $220,000 is being given to our district this year for you know, earned through AP testing. When we look at our IB program, remembering again, ranked fifth in the state, 
Um, always a very successful program. Here you see, and again, remember it's a different group of kids, of course, each time in the program. You see the different subject areas that are tested, and then the percent of the IB test passed per subject area. So as you can see, that um, English, literature, and Spanish being the highest um, success rate with percent tested. And then you can actually see more of the numbers in the chart on the bottom left, um, where you see the total exams um, taken versus passed, and then the funds to our school system due to IB, this year we're looking at approximately $142,000 just for our IB program for the success that they have had. Wasn't 2016 though a little bit of a positive anomaly that isn't 60% in somewhat more of the norm? Right. It's actually a little higher than the norm, but yes. But we're setting yeah. that 71%, and again, that's why I was reminding you that it's a different group of kids. Right. So sometimes you do have that, and you're right, that group was an anomaly. If you remember, that was also the year that we had, was it three to four National Merit Scholars, mm -hmm. which is even, you know, normally it's weird when you just have one, never mind three or four, you know, so that is that was definitely a group that was um, higher performing than the norm, norm IB group. <laughs> that's what I said. Okay, looking at our dual enrollment. Okay, here we've got our um, Citrus High, Crystal River, Lakanto, and AES, um, you know, making up our whole district. Last year, 2016, we had approximately you know 2,400 credits earned. This year, close to 3,000 credits earned <coughs> by our students. So when you see the breakdown per school, um, you see there how many credits earned for our students at each school versus the number of past courses for each school. And you can see the benefit of this on the next slide, where you see, of course, according to get credit, uh, in order to get credit, you must get an A, B, or C in a course. A D or an F in a dual enrollment course, you cannot receive credit. So if it, we had 93% of our courses did students took did receive an A, B, or C, with only a 7% D or F rate there for grade. And then over on the left, you can actually see the number of courses taken, um, courses passed and percent passed. And this is a very similar uh, percent that we did last year. Last year, we were, however, we were at a 94% A, B, or C. Last year, this year, we did decrease by 1% with that 93%. Um, and here you see the savings to our families, students that do participate in our dual enrollment courses. Um, when looking at the, the college board site and the college tuition comparison site, we saw for 2017, the average Florida four-year college in-state tuition with books was around 5,400 per year. So 180 per credit, and so when you look at the amount of credits that you're know, looking at, close to 2,900 credits, like we said, were earned, saving our families close to $530,000 in, you know, in funds where they are entering college already with this. And I'm, I'm speaking as a parent who benefit, benefited from this as well. Looking at our industry certification exams. Um, last year we had 448 tests taken. This year, 556 tests taken, which you know definitely an increase there with a 75% pass rate. Um, in on the bars, you see the green, of course, is the number of tests that were passed, compared to the red is the number of tests that were taken but did not pass. Um, you can see Chris River High, for example, had an 80% pass rate. Um, you know, but however, they might have had a smaller amount of tests taken. I have to also give credit to Crystal River High School because keep in mind that in that, that includes nursing um, certification, that includes uh, the base biomedical uh, certifications, two of which are extremely difficult ones to pass. So while that their pers their number of tests taken may not be as high as say with Kanto, they also have two of the most aggressive and most challenging certifications that you hear that. Yes, they do. And their pass rate, like you see there, is, is higher high. than the other two schools, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, when looking at our ACT data, all right, here we're looking at uh, national versus state versus our district in yellow. You see from 2013 to 2017. And then you see the lines represent each of our high schools. So we're looking at just our composite score here, okay, our composite score. So, you know, when looking at this, we have in the past, like as you can see, kind of decreased from last year to this year. Last year we had a 21 um, composite score compared to this year with a 19.1, which is less than the state and the nation. 
we are, uh, but when you look at the chart on the right, you see that we have significantly increased the number of tests taken for ACT. From last year, 523 to 676 ACT assessments given. Now, this could be contributed, like, and we've had discussions of why this is. Um, when we talked about it, actually, you guys talked about it earlier before, that you know this is being used as a concordant for ELA um, for the graduation requirement. So where students might not have necessarily taken ACT in the past, they are now taking it more so for that purpose. And taking absolutely multiple times. And last year was the first year we offered an in-district ACT session. So instead of waiting, you know, signing up for a Saturday, we actually had it during school um, on a Tuesday. We did it again this year for those students, benefiting those students that can't come on a Saturday or, you know, for, uh, for reasons you know, maybe um, money or so forth, they can come on, a, on that Tuesday, of course, during school and we can administer it then. So that definitely did increase the number of students taking the assessment because we were able to offer that. And this year we're actually offering it, we offered it in the fall and we're offering it in the spring. Excellent. All right, the SAT, you'll notice that we don't really have um, past year's data here because it is a, they totally revamped the SAT. It no longer has, the components are completely different. We now have evidence-based reading and writing together in one category. And then there's the math category. So it is a very different test and it was very difficult to compare when you looked at you know, each of those components compared to previous year's SATs. So we're kind of starting over with our SAT data here in this chart. So from now on, of course, you'll have more of a comparison. But as you can see here, we broke it down where the green is our math score, average math score. The blue is that average evidence-based reading and writing score. And then the little gray box on top is that average composite score. That's that, the, whole, the whole mean score. So as a district, we are equal with the nation with a 1,070 um, for the composite score. Where, but our evidence-based reading and writing seems to be a little higher than the nation where our math was a little bit lower than the nation when you looked at that. When you look at the bottom, you see how many of our students are actually taking this assessment, and it's part of this data. Um, as you can see, as a district, 31% of our students have taken this, um, which would have been 382 in our district that took the SAT. And we're talking about the 2017 grad year. Um, and the math portion can vary also. That if they had, A lot of the math is math that's really sophomore math. And if they don't take the test until their senior year, it can true. impact their, so I mean, that, and that's why I know, you know, following a lot of the Derek Bittner philosophies in our family, that's why we took it right. almost every year to be able to super score mm -hmm. and be able to have the advantage of all of that. Right, and another piece is, is that, again, SAT is used as concordant for ELA, but not for math. So if I'm taking this assessment for that purpose, I'm going to pay more attention and do better and focus more on the ELA part where I still have to complete the math, but it's not my emphasis. Yeah, like I, I'm not as worried about it. All right, so that concludes the data piece. Um, the next part, like I said before, is our initiatives with Mr. Hebert and Mr. Roland. It is a quarter to 12. How's the board feeling? Do we wanna keep going on to the keep next one? Okay. Hey, good morning. good morning. I'm in my orange for Unity Day, so supporting our team of Unity. Um, so for elementary, one of the pieces that we're working on in the area of math is um, our math TOSA. Beverly Tidwell provides a math tip to each elementary school that they can place in their school newsletters. So just an opportunity for something to help with parents. She's been doing this for the past couple of years, but it's an opportunity to reach out to our families and making sure they have some opportunities to help understand the, the world of mathematics. Um, we're supporting the Florida Math Standards with the use of our math modules. This is like a framework that our um, teachers have to help teach the standards because our focus is on the standards. We have our Florida Go Math curriculum, but the math modules really kind of help look at all the resources that teachers have available. It's available online. They can go and, and access those modules and then kind of help focus on the support of those standards using the assessments that are matched to the standards. So again, um, you know, we've guided teachers, we bring teachers in each year, um, we develop the modules, develop the assessments to make sure that they're involved in 
kind of helping them understand what those standards are and how to address those in the classroom. And then the MAPTOSA provides individual training for schools on how to use the resources that are available on the district site. This is just a snippet from the website, and again, you can see the resources that are available, timelines, modules, curriculum maps, practice assessments, online um, resources, and easy reference guides. Um, again, she provides the Tidwell's map tip each month, and then there's the Florida Standards um, website, and then CPOMS as well for teachers to access. So really trying to provide those, those resources for teachers, and again, they're digital, so teachers can access them 24-7, they don't cost any money. We make sure they're free for them, but they're available to them. Um, this is our um, elementary curriculum that we're currently using called um, Go Math. Um, at the beginning of next year, we will move into our adoption for mathematics. So we'll begin to look at some products starting next year for um, our math curriculum. But this is the curriculum we currently have. Okay. How long do we have it? Since March. Good morning. In the uh, area of secondary education, we've been encouraged by uh, results the last couple of years. Uh, we're continuing many of the practices we had in place, and, and we, you know, always look to for ways to improve. Uh, formative assessment using formative assessment is a big part of our math instruction. You know, working on teachers chunking that information and make sure students are getting that. We have more and more of our teachers reteaching to mastery uh, to ensure that students get that math content before they move on. Also doing that with the lowest quartile, making sure that we have formative assessment. We use the Citrus formative assessment as well as our, our schools have other math tools and resources uh, to uh, use formative assessment such as Study Island, um, Below you can see we have Alex as another tool that we're using in algebra. And in the middle school, they've been encouraged by Alex in the area of, of algebra and geometry. They're gonna to try to use that as a tool with our intensive math students as well. Uh, continuing to encourage and incorporate hands-on activities to deepen the understanding and deepen the learning for the math standards. Again, this is our resources that we use. This is our website that Ms. Tidwell uh, has created. So our teachers and parents have access to this material to, to go in and uh, help, help math instruction at our schools. And as Mr. Hebert pointed out, we're going through a math adoption next year. These are our current materials that we're utilizing in the middle school math. And these are the materials that we're using in our high school math courses. I just want to share too, I got a call last week from a parent that uh, was raving about our math TOSA at the district and said how Ms. Tidwell was so helpful to her in helping their child be able to have the resources they needed to be more successful in the classroom. So thank you, Ms. Tidwell. Um, in science, as you are aware, we are going through our elementary science textbook adoption currently. So Mr. Crawley and Dr. Geddes are leading us through that, um, reviewing, um, gathering teachers together to gather input, determine kind of next steps of rubric. And then um, I know this week we're going to be doing some publisher presentations for the elementary level and reviewing some of the textbooks that are available. So we're currently in that process now. Um, Fourth grade, as you may be aware, goes to Marine Science Station each year. Mr. Crawley, our Science TOSA, has been working with um, the Marine Science Station to kind of help develop resources and materials for the teachers to use before they go to the Science Center, while they're there, and then the, they return. So really trying to make sure that we're enhancing that program. Um, you know, when we hire new teachers, I, I remember myself being a new fourth grade teacher, you're going to Marine Science Station, I didn't know what to expect. And it was once I went that first year, then I knew the next year, oh, these are things I really should be doing before I go, during, and after. So we really want to make sure we provide those resources at the forefront for many of our teachers that are new to fourth grade. Um, fifth grade, we um, used what we um, a grant that we received from um, Duke Energy, and all of our fifth graders go out to the Duke Energy site. Um, if you go to YouTube, um, there's a video on YouTube that the Duke Energy has put out that kind of talks about that field trip 
it's about three to four minutes long, but it's very well done and really kind of shows some of the students and some of the work that was in action um, out there at the plant. Um, this past year, um, there was a grant that Mr. Crowley was involved in writing, and it was from Sable Trail, the, the big gas line that came through, and it was a, uh, a large grant, I believe over $60,000. Um, and it's called the Energize Me Elementary Summer Science Camp. So it's a three-year camp. Um, each year, students have the opportunity at the elementary school to um, have a science day at their school offered over the summer by teachers. A lot of hands-on activities. There's a, a little photograph there of, of one of the uh, pictures that was done, but positive, positive response from the students and the parents. Um, and the teachers, I believe, had a great time as well participating in that. So I know we're looking forward to next year again, continuing to um, you know, change it up a little bit and make sure and keep it exciting and motivating for our kids. Um, our science area, we also are supporting schools with science fair project development. As you know, it's not just secondary. We also do it at our elementary level. So Mr. Crowley's been very good about going out to all the schools, meeting with the teachers, and providing individual support to the schools because we want that base of understanding what, a, a, what science fair is all about and how to develop a, a good product and a good project. And then just providing professional development for effective science instruction as we're in, in this what we call gap year with the science textbooks. Mr. Crowley has been working very closely with our teachers and schools to help support that. At the secondary level, we're also going through a science textbook adoption um, we also have the Rain Science Station field trips for middle and high school. Science fair is a big part of what we do uh, at the secondary level, which reinforces the nature of science. And Mr. Crowley is currently working uh, with a book study with our middle school, one of our middle schools, on the nature of science. Also, a big part of what we do at the middle school level uh, is many labs that reinforce these standards. So st students will actually conduct experiments that reflect and reinforce the standards that they've been taught. As you know, in middle school, uh, the eighth grade science test is a culmination of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It's just not what they learn in eighth grade. So they're continuing to spiral those standards, sixth, seventh, and eighth, so students continually reinforce the previous standards that they've learned. In. And again, formative assessment is a big part of what we're doing in all areas. Uh, we have our citrus formative assessments as well as our study island that many of our schools use. And uh, Citrus High School saw a nice bump in their biology scores this past year from, the, from an assistance or using the tool for study island to, to help with that. Also, thinking of something we're doing at the high school, as we mentioned last year, our schools are pairing environmental science and biology together. Those two courses go hand in hand. Some schools are doing it within the same year. Some, like Citrus High School, is doing it at the end of this, uh, doing it the second semester in 10th grade and then the first semester in 11th grade. But pairing those two together, as we've seen some benefits uh, from student learning by pairing those up. Uh, and again, that formative assessment at the high school level and the utilization of study island to help reinforce and make sure our students are learning before we move forward in determining what we may need to reteach. lower so to make improvements um, in grades three through five um, some areas that I noticed where we scored lower is in geometry and so um, an example of a multiple choice question would look like um, what is three-fourths of a model so if a student just looks at it quickly and cho um, chooses it might be hard to choose that but that's a pretty simple one but when you look at the types of questions that they're being given, you have equations, editors, and grids. Now, um, something that's going to be taking place at the end of next year, there are students in grades um, up through grade six will go back to paper-based testing. So that will limit the number of questions that they'll be given. But they are still given 
questions at this rigor. So if they just look at, say, the grid question, it's giving them a sixth of the shape, and it's asking them to complete the whole shape. So completely different than a multiple choice question. So just to have the teachers and the students to have that type of fractional understanding and knowledge, um, we did some trainings this summer where we used AIM strategies and instead of bringing out the egg cartons and training y'all, um, I did train my department and ed services with the egg carton math and um, so you can add fractions using egg cartons and I trained, um, we had a training for grades three through five math and actually it was just the teachers coming, we didn't provide any pay and we had over 50 teachers wow. um, for that in the summer. So, and I'm going to be doing some more training this school year with different um, schools on that training. So the word got out and they're excited about it. So um, geometry is a trend. So grades six through eight was also a low area. And it's not the type of geometry that's just, you know, what is the shape? If you see the questions, I taught geometry for a long time in high school. These are more of the types of geometry questions that I taught in high school. Finding the total area of a shape where you have to break the shape apart and use multiple formulas. So um, using the grid and then it tells them that they have to like, where well, you might break that up into a triangle and a trapezoid. It tells them that they have to read it correctly and carefully. They have to use two line segments to break that up. So if they just want to break it up in one way, if they don't read the question carefully, they can miss that and then find the total area. Um, this is something we've noticed, especially um, in our lower areas, and this is one of my goals for the year, is um, our ESE scores were very low for this year, and so um, Alex was added at two of our schools at Inverness uh, Middle School and at Citrus Springs Middle School and so for the intensive math and I just gave you an example of what this looks like in one of the score reports um, and this is at Inverness Middle School where they're putting them into an RTI math and we're seeing great progress already and a lot of our lower level students, our ESE students are in these classes so we're seeing growth in yellow, that's in whole numbers, and it just breaks up in the pieces. And this is a whole class progress, and you see that they're already 59% of the way through. When I made this slide, this was a couple of weeks ago. So as they finish this, they will get moved into, this is a seventh grade intensive math class, they'll get moved into the regular seventh grade um, program, so they're just doing awesome. So. Um, the next at the Algebra 1, um, where I noticed they were lower, were in statistics and probability. At my state meeting I just went to last week, um, Terry Sebring from the state of Florida also said that statistics is where we're seeing she just doesn't think that the teachers are teaching statistics. And so they think that they just need to teach algebra, but they're doing students a disservice if they don't teach the statistics as well. So um, there's an example of statistics, and you can teach a lot of things within this question. Um, the next one was something when I taught high school, I didn't know about residuals. So this was something that I just threw up there as an example, open response question. But since I knew that I never taught it, this is something that I'm doing this year with my, um, my PDP is I'm writing not only my Tidwell math tips, but I'm writing grade specific newsletters to teachers. And so I gave an example of what an Algebra 1 newsletter would look like for teachers. And so it has a residual um, standard of the month on residuals. And it has the definition of what a residual is and places that they can go, sample letters, or, I'm sorry, sample lessons and places where they can get um, small group activities and um, ways to increase mathematical discourse with their students. Um, and then also using an Algebra One Math Nation has quite a bit of statistics in it. So throughout the year, you know, reminding the teachers when you have it separated by Algebra One teachers, 
um, on your email, it's easier just to you know shoot a little thing to remind them, a little email to remind them to remember to use Math Nation. They have great sources for statistics, and hopefully we'll see an increase in our statistics this year. So, and then our algebra at the lowest levels are using Alex at the high school. Um, and then in geometry, our lowest area is modeling with geometry. And so there were two sample items for this. And one of them is just um, a different thing where you can pick multiple items that where you're seeing in the shape. Um, and you just select all that you see. But this is one right answer. So if a student misses anything, they get the whole question wrong. And then on the next one, this is just something that in geometry, I never taught in geometry, so it might be something that teachers are, you know, overlooking the standards. So again, I'm going to be writing the geometry newsletter, making sure that they're aware of the standard. And um, but this is a very highly missed standard, and this was one also that Terry Sebring brought out in the geometry discussion. So um, this is one that we're definitely going to hit on. And again, the geometry nation workbooks. We're all ordered um, Dr. Geddes this year with instructional materials, um, made sure that anybody that wanted the geometry workbooks um, were able to get those and we purchased those for our teachers and quite a bit of the schools took us up on that offer and got them for their program. So, any questions? share with you some of the instructional science initiatives in place for the 2017-2018 school year. Several factors went into developing these initiatives, starting with the fact that our jobs of tomorrow are in the fields of science. One of our most important jobs as science teachers is to not only foster a love of science, but also to help our students identify the areas and branches of science that they're most passionate about. When planning these initiatives, uh, taking a look at our data really helped us to identify some areas to focus on. We want to focus on nature of science and life science at both the elementary and middle school level. Um, we also looked at how science can support ELA and math. So ELA key ideas, details, integration of knowledge idea, and ideas are among our lowest reporting clusters. Uh, especially in the, when our students are dealing with informational text, which is exactly what science is. And math, as, as Beverly mentioned earlier, you know, measurement, data, geometry are also some of our lowest reporting categories in math. And good science instruction, it really supports all of those things. So this past summer, um, I was very fortunate to facilitate some PD with um, fifth grade teachers from every one of our uh, elementary schools across the county to develop model listed activities. Um, these are your larger project-based project, project -based type lessons that students will engage in that will incorporate reading, it will incorporate writing, uh, math, and all through a design challenge that they have to that they have to complete. It's, it's open-ended where it's real inquiry, where students will come up with their own answers, their own results, not something that's predetermined. Um, through that same session of PD, we also developed these mini labs to support the nature of science at the fifth grade level. In middle school spiraling fair game standards into our daily uh, middle school instruction um, to really as as Mr. Rowland mentioned earlier to, to support the fact that two-thirds of the science test in middle school is from sixth and seventh grade, and they, they only take it in eighth grade. I'm also facilitating two book studies this year, one in elementary school and one at the um, middle school level. So the mini labs that I mentioned a moment ago, um, our elementary <coughs> teachers begin the year with various lab stations set up around the room that allow our students to gain confidence. Uh, with the tools and the methods that real scientists use, with a focus on measuring and collecting data, then analyzing that data and communicating it to each other. We're really trying to focus this year on student-to-student -student 
talk. We really want to get the kids engaged in what they're learning and talking about it. And there's a couple of pictures of some of the teachers that have already tried doing the mini labs at the beginning of the year. And as you can see, the students are kind of just around the room. This is not a, um, okay, we started and we finished it today thing. It lasts a couple of weeks. The kids really get engaged in collecting their data in a science notebook. And there's a follow-up with analysis and whatnot. Middle school, um, we went and said, you know, two thirds of that test is from the two previous years. And so we designed these um, spiraling fair game standard lessons that, that teachers can do at the eighth grade level, which really are designed to be a mini lesson at the beginning of every class. They're graph and image based. So that way, we're, again, we're focusing on data analysis and placing an emphasis on student to student discussion about their concepts. They are all formatted to mirror what state assessment questions look like. So it's very much so reading a data table, reading a graph, reading an image, and then having conversations about what information you could pull off of those images and talking about what types of questions could actually be on a state test in regards to those. The book study at the elementary level, what's your evidence engaging K-5 students in constructing explanations in science? This is really based on the claims evidence reasoning framework. Um, again, we are trying to get students to engage in their own learning and develop a claim off of some sort of research that they've done, provided evidence and reasons for why they feel that claim is the correct claim. Now at the elementary level, which goes she now at the beginning of the year, it could be as simple as writing a scientific explanation that answers a question like how do snowflakes form? Um, the student would write a sentence that states how they feel snowflakes form. That's their claim. Their evidence, they're going to have to go do some research. Now this could be done digitally. This could be done through materials that the teacher provides. It's all based on weather data, which fits right into their standards, of course. And um, they're going to have to provide evidence to support their claim of how snowflakes form. And again, their reasoning is a statement that connects your evidence to your claim about how snowflakes form. Do you have a problem with students having never seen snowflakes? <laughs> and, and this was, again, this was just an example. Um, yeah, it could be a biased question there, I guess, but hopefully we're trying to ex expose them to things that aren't just out their front door at times, too. Very good. And I was thinking, you're going to ask, what's a snowflake? <laughs> yeah. Um, this was actually the first question I did with the teachers in the book study a, a few days ago. Uh, Half of them are from northern states, so it was not an issue. <laughs> uh, sorry, at the elementary level, we're really trying to focus on the kids just being able to come up with a claim on their own, and every kid or every group that's working is going to have their own claim. It's not a predetermined outcome sort of scenario. We want the kids to have their own claim, providing reason, reasoning and evidence for that claim. Now, as we move into middle school, the book study is based again on the claims evidence reasoning framework, but now we're starting to introduce counter claims. So not only do students do claims evidence reasoning through their own research, but the other students are going to have counter claims and rebuttals, and now we start getting into something called ADI, which is argumentative design instruction. And that's our ultimate goal, is to you know have students that can critically think for themselves and say, this is what I think about this science topic, and here's the reasons why. Um, starting with elementary and middle school to, to do this, our, our, one of my biggest goals is to develop a cohort of students that this is part of their normal instructional culture, that they are going to have student-to-student -student dialogue discussing science concepts, their opinions and feelings about those concepts, so when they get to high school, it's already part of their culture, making it that much easier for our teachers in high school, where the concepts are much deeper, to, to start to, to do some of these types of activities in high school. And as um, a English teacher, you taught this for argument, Yes, ma'am. Right? Yes, ma'am. It would be great for them to come to high school with this already. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, the, the other part of this type of teaching is, you know, you have students that are arguing their own point about 
a specific science concept. And that starts to point them in the direction of where they're passionate about maybe life science. Maybe they're passionate about space science, which again brings us back to my first point, that one of our biggest jobs as a science teacher is to not only ignite that passion for science, but help them, help them to identify where they let their passions for science lie. So, um, really excited about the science initiatives in place this year, and I greatly appreciate the support, the continued support that the board gives us for these things, our local communities, our school communities, and I'd like to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Before we go to the technology part, or how does the board feel? Do you want to keep going or do you want breaks? So we do have the technology choices, and then we have Dr. Geddes. We also have student services and ESE. So, Madam Chair. How long will this next part take? Technosis? Ten minutes max. Ten minutes for the technosis. Twenty, okay. 20 so, for me. Yeah. And then twenty for Dr. Geddes. All right, thirty more minutes, and then we'll break for lunch. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, we may just be able to just keep going and get it done. We may. <clears throat> hop over to our other presentation here. Are, are you down by one member? Isn't there somebody are, supposed to be with you? We are this year. Miss, Miss Diana Willsby, she is, uh, Diana mm -hmm. Willsby, sorry. She is um, at the Kento Middle School. She is the curriculum coach over there. So she is no longer with us. So it's just Miss Jones and I this year, right? Really? Mm -hmm. Serving is different. So Megan and I are going to bounce back and forth with this. And typically, in our typical fashion, we'll probably jump into what each other are saying. but. Um, I'll try to make it go very, very quickly. So this is, this year, as the two of us are kind of, again, down Deanna, we kind of wanted to make sure that we were covering as much of the district as possible. Being down one person made it a little bit more difficult, but we, we, we kind of split our district map in half, and we were able to make ourselves more present on school campuses on a more recurring basis. Last year was a little bit um, where if teachers had uh, and technology issues that they were working through if they had a pedagogical piece that they were trying to here's an excellent app that I want to use in the classroom for student voice and choice or here's an excellent tool that I that I heard is great but I want to watch you guys use it in the classroom first um, we would be scheduled for those things on more of like a per diem basis but this year we're using this uh, technology professional growth model and we are more on campuses readily available for those teachers to like, hey, I see you in the hallway. Can you help me with this technology mm -hmm. issue? Um, so the, just that presence of having us on campus and just being more visual um, and having more of a presence there, it's really been beneficial for us. Um, this is attached to the presentation that um, uh, Amy was giving earlier. So this is like a link directly on that slide. So if you click on that link, it'll take you to this one. Yeah, so digitally. No, no hard code, sorry. Um, so if I had to define our role in one sentence, I would say that it's, it's, it's engaging or it, it is developing high-end engagement practices as well as instructional practices for these teachers in, in this coaching cycle. It's providing those tools, say, we have all this technology at our disposal. We are in a problem of riches here in this district, which is an excellent problem to have because not only do we have our iPad initiative, we have you know, every teacher has a laptop and we have, you know, student stations in addition to all of our one-to-one -one and cart-based um, iPad scenarios in different schools. So it really is how do I use this technology, not only to um, assist myself, but how do I engage the students with it? So we're really in the role of establishing those engagement practices as well as helping new teachers especially too with their instructional practice as well. So in addition to, and these are a couple of icons, uh, in addition to making uh, it more relevant for uh, for teachers to schedule us. It's, it's really, you know, waking up those sleeping students and making <laughs> visual for them, and as well as engaging. I see. After two years, he finally got you an emoji. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think I had to send that to him. Did you? <laughs> it's a good emoji. By the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we just want to walk you through the basic steps within this this coaching cycle, this technological growth develop and development. Um, the first, we start off by establishing goals. This happens both individually with teachers and at school levels, as well as looking at the district data from our most recent year and 
looking at our areas of need and um, how technology can support those. So focusing in on the school and teacher level, at the end of last year, we started setting up meetings with administrative staff and teachers to determine, okay, reflecting back on the school year, how would we like to start off on the next school year? What, were our, what will our foundational pieces be? And so we have a couple school-wide initiatives going on in the district, as well as several teachers that are fully engaged in regular coaching cycles to develop their technological practices within their classrooms. Um, it's been really great to have this goal-oriented approach to our role and to be more as coaches and um, the cheerleaders for these teachers as they step into the great unknown of technology and take risks in their classrooms and see those payoffs. And everybody really is on a different stop of their technology train. It doesn't matter if a teacher really wants to, if they're day one, I don't know how to turn this iPad on. <laughs> what do you have, what are your suggestions? We will work with teachers no matter what their depth of knowledge is, um, and we'll bring instructional practice along with that. So this is just a picture of uh, one professional development that we were at with Rock Crusher, and there, we always say tasks before apps. So if the question is, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm teaching today, what apps do I need? Well, we say that's the wrong question. What are, what are you doing with the students? Well, what's your end goal? And then, this, for instance, this group was uh, designing a, a lesson, or this group of teachers wanted to really advocate for student voice choice, and they wanted to have students reflect on what they were learning. So we said, okay, we now know that that's what you wanted to do. So let's introduce this app called Flipgrid. It is a video-based reflection tool. It's on a grid that the teachers can use. So not only do they get to see uh, a use of the technology piece, they get to see, okay, well, here's exactly how it's benefiting my students. It's standard-based, and it, it helps with instruction as well. Um, so because of this more coaching approach with teachers and schools, our time has really been taken advantage of this year. Um, we are in schools almost every single day, with the exception of one day a week, just so we can get together and collaborate. Um, last year, we really took it, as we reflect back on it, we took more of a reactive approach in our role with technology, and so teachers would reach out to us and then we would show up and assist them in any way that they felt necessary. This year, taking this more proactive approach with our technology integration in the classrooms, um, we still wanted to have an option for teachers to reach out individually. We have schedules where we are at certain schools um, every week or every other week, and the teachers at those schools know that, but being just two of us, sometimes that schedule leaves a teacher in need. So we still utilize um, classroom support through a, a scheduling system where teachers can reach out on their own via a website and request for us to show up in their classroom. Sometimes this means coming in and modeling a lesson within the classroom. Sometimes it means sitting with them and lesson planning based on the content area. Sometimes it means just having a conversation with them um, on a very foundational level of why technology integration is so important in our students' lives right now. So again, in addition to those regular coaching and visits with the schools, we are still developing those relationships one-on-one -on -one with teachers and we are still available to them through reaching out um, individually on their own time and according to their schedule. I've got a question. So on your schedules, 20% of your work week is, is not in the schools. I mean, you have one day a week where you spend here at the district office, I guess. Okay, so how is that working though if you're a position down? Um, I take it we're able to do this with two with two of you then? Or we're still being able to take a full we're, day? we're stretched a bit thin. I, I'd say that our when we are out in schools, um, we are we are we're definitely working full days at the schools and and on Mondays when we're here for our meeting days, it's really just to catch up, reflect with each other, plan for the week ahead. And But if there's like a very pressing issue, if we're at a school that has previously said, hey, this is the only day that works for us, we will be at that school on that one, that one day that we would have otherwise been scheduled to be here. So. Thank you. <laughs> okay, when the vacancy came open, it was right at the start of the school year. So the decision was already we were dealing with trying to gather teachers for our classrooms and the concern was to if we posted the position which we did but it was the very first week of school what would we be doing to those students to pull somebody out so the decision was made to hold they may have been doing an incredible job of trying to balance themselves across the schools getting into them 
And when you say 20%, Monday morning we meet as a professional development team. Everybody in the TOSA is process we meet and we share what's happening in the schools, what are we working on, what's our professional development focus. Um, and it kind of keeps us all aligned so that we're able, as we visit classrooms, we're able to know, okay, I know this was done in, in social studies recently, let me support that instruction. So that's really, it's really a team effort. It's been hard. And when they're saying they're here Mondays planning, yes, they plan, and then I watch them run out at 11.30. I gotta be at Citrus for just a few minutes to go help this teacher or something, and I've gotta run to a school over there. And they do that throughout the day. They go to help because they, will, they are really doing a lot of collaborative planning modeling in the schools and giving a lot of feedback for that. So as for that position, it's been held, it's been open. Um, we have the intent of posting it in November to see if we can perhaps have a January hire date. We again, we'll again look at our current vacancies, how we do in the, the Pittsburgh job fair to see how we're doing. So we're really trying to monitor it, but they, they have really spread themselves out across the district there at this school, then at that school throughout the day. So I hope that addresses the draft. So in addition to having that booking website that they, they can book us on, our, on, a, on an individual basis, this is sort of a, I'm not sure if this gets bigger, but I'll just explain it as it is. This is a, a Google Sheet that is sent out when we're on, typically when we're on campus and uh, we know that we're going to be there for a day, the day previous to that, we'll send out an email to their staff saying, hey, if you'd like to sign up for a 30 minute block for, of time to have us just come uh, speak with you, if there's, again, if there's an app that you want to use, if there's a technology question uh, in terms of implementation that you have, we'll meet with you. If they want to schedule more than one 30 minute block, they're welcome to do so. And this is, I will, I, I, I'm comfortable saying this, this is on a regular basis, 99% of the time, when we send this out, it is completely filled up wall to wall for the entire day. So teachers are utilizing this. It's, it's they're, they're not intimidated by maybe filling out an official form that goes out and it's and it's more of a, a it's less intimidating for them to fill this out. But um, we, are, we are booked quite often. <laughs> Um, and I also want to add on that previous schedule that you saw, there are also times, what, what you don't see in that image is on this Google Sheet, we have multiple tabs at the bottom so that we identify future dates that we may be at that school. And oftentimes I will look ahead three or four visits in the future and see teachers, the same teacher who will sign up to, for me to come to their classroom every week or every two weeks because they, they caught the bug. And now they, every day we just do something more, do something more, they master it and then we come back to visit them. So we've really just been developing those relationships and, and true coaching cycles with technology. And the students know us by our names too, so that's always great when we go to those classrooms. Um, but we also wanted to talk about how we are, we're empowering teachers to learn how to in, um, implement technology in their classroom and then to become teacher leaders with technology in their schools and with their peer groups. So we encourage the use of um, social media platforms like Twitter here in the district. This example that we have up is a teacher, again, at Brock Crusher Elementary, and we worked with them in one of the previous images on use, the use of Flipgrid, and then she tweeted out how her students had begun to use Flipgrid to express their voice and their choice in what they were learning. So we really work with teachers. We don't want the credit. We want them to, to show and to brag about what their students are doing and to demonstrate their growth, because what we have found is when we empower teachers, um, it, other teachers flock to them. Uh, I have another teacher that I worked with at an elementary school, and I, I talked to her all year last year, really wanted to get in there and work with her on technology, but she was sort of hesitant. This year, she embraced it. I modeled one lesson with her, and she has told everybody in that school. So my next three visits are booked with that school because um, she was empowered to share about how wonderful this was in her classroom. So that's really what we've been doing is creating teacher leaders in our role. And you, what has been exciting to watch is how Twitter in particular has become a PLC in Citrus County. And I see it all the time indirectly sharing by just saying, hey, I did this in my classroom today, and somebody going, oh man, I want to try that. And it's catching on. And it's not that it's even really that outside of sometimes those circles are seeing it, but it's the right circles that are seeing it. And it's making real impact. So thank you. Hey, know that it didn't happen overnight. It's taken time. <clears throat> <laughs> <See>? <laughs> okay. 
So we'll, I just we just want to close with saying we, we are continuing to celebrate that success that we're seeing in the classroom. It's not about us. It's not about celebrating a particular piece of hardware. It's not about celebrating any device that you're using. It's about celebrating the learning um, that's taking place, the stuff that would not be achievable without the piece of technology. We want to see that stuff. So we are um, continuing to post that. Uh, those things that we are seeing on CCSB Innovates using the hashtag on Twitter, Instagram is also there. And uh, we are encouraging teachers to do the same. So you'll see a lot of that stuff on uh, social media as the year goes on. And hopefully subsequent years you'll see that just start to build. So thank you guys. Before you get down, because I think it's important, you know, we've stressed in the technology world, it's not about technology, it's about the instruction. The technology is the tool. There is a tool that I think has become a game changer in a positive way. And I can tell you every time my wife talks about it, it's changing the way teachers are able to use the one-to-one -one in the classroom. And that's Apple Classroom. Mm -hmm. Can you just share, because it really is changing how teachers can control their classroom now. Sure. Uh, just briefly, Apple Classroom is something that is relatively new, and I wish they called it Apple iPad Manager. That's kind of a, <laughs> better because there's so many apps called Classroom, and then I, I tell teachers to, to, to download it, and they're like, it is 15 apps that are called Classroom. Which one do you mean? But um, it's the one that Apple has made. It's strictly iPad based, and only teacher, only the teacher needs to download it. It is an app that runs on their device. The students don't need to install anything. It's a simple enrollment process, and then once all the students are enrolled in that teacher iPad for that class, the teacher can view the screen on the iPad. They can kind of track understanding if they're working through a problem like in math or something. Um, they can see gaps uh, in, in knowledge, like if they tell them to do some research and they're viewing all the screens. If a student is Googling something that they have no idea, like what is a verb or something like that, they, and they're in you know, ninth grade where they should have had that previous instruction, just quietly, the teacher can assess what they're doing and, not, and just know that they have to reteach that stuff. So they're seeing the content that's going on on the student's screens on their iPad screen as well. And they can do a whole bunch of other things, like lock the devices if they need to for all eyes on me. Um, and a couple of other and things. that's used a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting. I know through walkthroughs with administrators, we talk about the power zone. Correct. Yeah. And the interesting thing that my wife has said is, well, because of the Apple Classroom, I am the power zone. Mm -hmm. Because at any moment, I know what these students are doing and where they're going mm -hmm. in their classroom. Right. And she said, you know, it's it's funny because you also can see them figuring things out, and just like you're saying, you can go over and talk to them. There's humorous things that they're doing. They're interacting in ways that, that you know, the teacher now is a part of that process and learning, where before they were just elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for it. Dan, you have, have done a great job. Many you've done a great job supporting it, because um, it, it's going to be a game changer as, as more teachers understand that tool is going to be really a changer for them. I well, and if we if we follow along on that with what Vice President Apple told us at the uh, Florida School Board Association conference, that's leading up to collaborative learning outside of bricks and mortar schools, mm -hmm. which in some ways is quite intriguing if we look at the future of education. It's hard for me to grasp that, you know, to not have students in a building, mm -hmm. but to have students. But this is, you know, this is still old school teaching. Um, I, I talk all the time. The, the stuff that Tom, my yeah, wife, is yeah. teaching, it's the same was teaching she did 25 years ago. The, just the difference is instead of holding a piece of paper in her hand, she's got her iPad. But the stories are the same. The literature's the same. And the instruction, that one-on-one -on -one with that student, that's the part I disagree with Apple. Because, and with, with that Apple VP, we need, we need to make sure we never get rid of that. Because that interaction with that student and that teacher is critical to that little student's learning. It's the difference of the tool they get an opportunity to to learn and ex expand on. Yeah, There's a term I heard all the time uh, a couple of years ago called distance learning, and I think people equate like one to one with there's no more teacher and you just do everything virtually and um, it's simply not the case. I mean, we see, like you were saying, uh, Mr. Kang, there, there's traditional teaching going on, but now we just have a conduit to a whole bunch more stuff thanks to the technology. So. Shakespeare right now, my wife is in the middle of teaching, mm -hmm. and while she's got a lot of great, you know, tools to help engage, it's still Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you?
Their 10 minutes was 20, so my 20 is not 40. No. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I'll really be brief, but I, I do want to uh, thank Dan and Megan for the good job they're doing. Yes. I heard uh, Megan doing a presentation at the secondary curriculum meeting recently, and I thought, how awesome, how strategic, how proactive. And really, that's Dan talked about the blessing uh, of technology that we have in the school district, and that's my first slide, is really just to thank you our school board and Ms. Hemmel, our superintendent for leadership and expectation along that line. Uh, my purpose today, just to kind of give you the broad overview, I'm gonna go quickly past some slides because uh, you've probably seen them or familiar with that, but basically we have two data centers. Um, as strategic and as Dan and Megan's uh, kind of discussion was, I'm a little more operational and certainly support strategic, strategic um, direction. But basically we have two data centers, uh, those two data centers support all of the hardware and software systems that we use in our, in our school district. Um, we've talked before about classroom technology. Uh, it's fantastic to hear people come uh, here from other places and they're just kind of surprised and as astonished in some ways at how much classroom technology that we have. And not only do we have it, but we have to support it and maintain it. And so I think we do a fairly good job with that, and try to anyway. I'm gonna be talking about some specifics of that technology uh, relating to networks. Nuts and bolts of, com of computers, you know, we've got roughly uh, 8,200 student computers. That includes over a thousand uh, teacher computers that we recycled last year to accommodate testing. We've got, you see there, 1,200 or so teacher computers, uh, 400 staff computers, bunch of servers. Almost 10,000 computers uh, and then almost 300 servers across the district. Our student computers were purchased in 2010, 2011. So they're certainly in need of a refresh and we have that as part of our five year capital budget uh, plan starting this year. And so basically um, in our capital budget, you know that's not, um, unlimited funds anymore. Our capital budgets have been reduced and so um, we're challenged in how we use those. We have to use them judici judiciously, carefully, but we have a three-year replacement cycle for student computers uh, beginning this year. And so that would buy roughly 2,000 computers, a mix of desktop notebooks and then some computer computer cars. And those to support those them. notebooks that we're talking about are the iPads, is that right? No, sir. Notebooks are Windows computers. Okay. Yeah. Windows. So the 2,000 computers here that you're talking about, that are the desktop, the notebook, and the new computer cards, yeah. are mainly for testing? Not definitely for testing. I wouldn't say mainly for testing because they would be used for curriculum purposes. If you look on the previous slide, I just backed up. Um, you know, we've got roughly, what, 8,000, 8,200 student computers, combination of desktop and notebooks now. All right, but the notebooks are not the Apple iPads. No, they're not, no. I'm okay. going to talk about those you're, you're a little bit later. The, the iPads coming up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, keep, I mean, um, I didn't mean to, to, to interrupt your train of thought. So, no, no, no. So, these are used for a variety of curricular purposes, you know, ongoing instruction, labs. Um, we have a... a a variety of instructional uh, systems we use for um, you know in our curriculum education process and so those computers are used, used for that so I'll talk a little bit more about uh, iPads and one-to-one -one in a second bandwidth um, is pretty much quadrupled uh, this year over last year in every area and so we've gone from elementary schools, we had 200 megabit uh, network connections, now a gig, gigabit, 1,000 meg megabytes. Uh, middle schools up from 500 to 2 gig. High schools up from 500 to 2 gig. District up to 5 gig, as well as the um, DSC and the TRC uh, network circuits. And then we've doubled our internet circuit from one gig to two gig um, from last year to this year. So that's all very good. We're trying to keep up with the pace of, uh, you know, expanding technology use in our school district, instructionally and administratively. Um, the cool thing I want to point out is despite all of those significant increases, 
our costs are still uh, almost sixty-six thousand dollars a year less than we've been paying prior. And so right now our annual network internet cost is around three hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. Eighty percent of that cost is reimbursed through the um, the E-rate program. So. You guys all right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'm afraid you missed that big savings there. I don't yeah. want you to miss that. Now, uh, Sixty-six thousand dollars a year savings uh, with all that bandwidth like increase. Yeah. Like that. But it was worth repeating. Yeah, it was worth <laughs> repeating. And uh, and then basically, I've shared a little bit of this in the past, but it just shows you how our uh, needs are increasing over time as we get more computer-based testing, more dependent on hosted um, educational resources outside of our school district. So now, from uh, 100 meg megabytes, I guess some of us have that at home now almost. Mm -hmm. um, we're at two gigabytes uh, for our internet circuit. And so I think I've told you in the past that we monitor our bandwidth usage on a daily basis. And you, you know, you want a certain amount of headroom um, space. And so we compare what we have versus how, how it's being used. We also compare that with um, state recommendations uh, and other recommendations and so I've shown you this before but the State Educational Tre Technology Directors Association these are their numbers um, that they're recommending for our, our particular they're crazy the, I'm they're, sorry they're, they're crazy. crazy I think I, I told you in the past <laughs> out of curiosity I went to one of their meetings at FETC well, they're sponsored by all the telecommunications groups. Jeez, you know, um, so, <laughs> so, you know, we can never afford that. No, no school district in the state has these numbers or could afford those numbers based on their uh, respective school populations. But uh, down on the lower right, um, you'll see, I lost my cursor here, FCC also had more realistic expectations for um, bandwidth. So, for example, short term, which is now they say gig and a half, or we're at two gig, so that's that's realistic. Certainly, we'll monitor this, uh, continue to monitor it. But my point to you is, I think we're in really good shape based on what we see usage wise. We're not paying for more than we need, but we've got a little headroom, headroom to grow. Um, our wireless infrastructure is very very important because of all the devices that we have out there, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. But basically. We use um, a company called Ru Ruckus, it's a ZoneFlex R710. Uh, they're high performing devices. Uh, you can see they're purpose built for uh, high capacity, high performance, interference laden environments like schools and, and other places. Each access point, and they're really radios, has two radios, a 2.4 gigahertz and a five gigahertz. And each of those radios has a capacity of 250 users. And so right now we've got about 315 uh, deployed throughout the district. We've got another, another 160, uh, 161 to deploy. And basically the point is we're continuing to add devices to increase the density of the, those devices and improve the wireless performance around our, our school district. Now one of the things that's helped this um, significantly and again you know, it pleases me to share that we're um, taking advantage of E-rate funding in a way we really haven't done in the past, Category 2 funding. And so, um, Category 2, is, as defined, consists of internal connections, equipment or services nece necessary to bring broadband into and provide it throughout school lab, uh, schools. So basically, through the Category 2 E-rate program, which has been funded, we're able to purchase these powerful network switches that we're going to deploy throughout our school district to meet the latest and greatest standards recommended to us by uh, everyone. And we'll have a 10 uh, gigabyte network backbone. So you saw high schools at two right now, middle schools at two, elementary schools, at, we'll be able to grow into this. 80% of that reimbursed by E-rate, 80% of that 380,000. Same with access points. We're purchasing more wireless access points. Category 2 E-rate funds, 80% of that reimbursed by E-rate. So basically through that Category 2 funding, 
we're realizing almost $373,000 worth of equipment. That's awesome. Doing very well saving us money. Yeah, well, that, that's a good thing because really, that's a lot of money. Is that still being managed through your office now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So very that, good. That is still a big part of your job. Not, yeah, I don't apply for E-rate, but I work with the E-rate. But I know with E-rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so basically, if you were to summarize some of uh, my department's priorities for this school year, again, it's what I just shared with you, increased network bandwidth, uh, increased wireless network uh, infrastructure across the board, implement that 10 gigabit um, network switching infrastructure. I'm gonna tell you something, basically two guys in our network area, that's a probably over a year's project, a lot of work. Now, I won't list all these by name, but enterprise applications, um, all of us know and use Microsoft Exchange or email system. Um, we're beginning to really see some benefits of the Office 365 and the online Microsoft Office, as well as Google Applications for Education. And um, we use a lot of tools to help manage uh, and support our technology infrastructure. Again, I won't go into all of those, but and that's not all of them there are, but um, they're very helpful. Uh, moving right along, our one-to-one -one initiative. Mr. Dodd, we're in our fifth year of that initiative. Again, um, what's driving that is engaging rigorous curriculum and the transition to digital curriculum. I like what Mr. Kennedy shared earlier. It's not about the technology. It's about teaching and learning. Technology is a, a means to that end. And that's what thrilled me when I heard Megan uh, talking to the secondary curriculum group the other day. It wasn't about technology. It was integrating it into teaching and learning and having a more engaging, uh, challenging, rigorous um, curriculum. It was awesome. Try to get Yes. I just, yeah. uh, on that prior screen with your email system. Yeah. Um, and I know uh, Ms. Counts is uh, the first year on the board here, so uh, I just wanted to, again, verify, and I know we've talked about this, but our emails are um, kept yes. uh, as public record, and you are, the, as the custodian of that public record that comes over the emails, um, is um, those messages that are, are archived and can always be accessed. Yep. I got the slide back up at the very bottom you'll see one of our systems is called Barracuda email archiving system really by federal law we're required to do that and so we do it I'm gonna tell you um, every once in a while I'm called upon either to do a public records request or something like that it amazes me because we've got probably 10 12 million messages in there and I'll put a few search parameters in there out of all of that content it'll pull up what we're looking for pretty quickly so yes regardless if you delete it whatever you do with it we have a copy of that that we can access in that uh, Very good. system yeah and we do do it on occasion mainly i'm trying to keep mr mullen out of trouble here but <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that thank you <laughs> okay. all right one to one initiative we're in our fifth year um currently we've got twelve thousand five hundred devices deployed uh, and a recap of where they're at, 4th and 5th grade, classroom use, middle school take home, 9th, 10th, 11th take home, and high school uh, is scheduled to, to be deployed this coming school year, 2018. Dr. Gettys, one thing I, I know that, because we just talked about laptops, and this is always, you know, there's a still such a huge misconception. Irrespective of the district or the device, one-to-ones are not being used for testing that I'm aware of really anywhere. Because, the, because of, exactly, because of this, the, the securing of them, even if, the, if you had laptops deployed, the trouble is you can't use the one-to-one -one laptops for testing without pulling those from the students. So the frustration that we often are under is that we're having to provide, or we are providing, and doing what's right for students, we're providing one-to-one. But because in order to meet testing mandates, we have to provide testing labs, which is where these refreshing comes in. And, and that's difficult to explain to the public. 
let alone to even understand it ourselves, that we have two concurrent infrastructures that serve very different purposes. And, and they're not cheap. No, it's expensive to uh, sustain. You're correct, there's no not a uh, school district I'm aware of that's doing testing on one-to-one -one devices. Just logistically and for a lot of other reasons, you know, it's not practical. I just have to say something. Yes, ma'am. We all do elementary schools for our stacks, uh, but I wasn't aware when I was that our third graders didn't have it. So all of this technology is gone and we've got this influx of SAX money and we've got some third grade kids. They're spending their own money to get third grade. But you can't money. use SAC money for it. No. You can't, it's against the red book. Oh, They're making requests, but the, the requests will be denied. Yeah. Yeah. But I, would, so, I wonder if we could visit how we could yeah. the elementary school at the third grade level. As part of our capital funding discussion, Certainly, that could be part of the conversation. Look at this next slide. You'll see that um, we're scheduled through uh, to next year to expand to 12th grade. And then at the very bottom, uh, unlike our earlier plan, um, we have no current plans or funding for grades K through three. And again, it was a capital budget conversation. That, mm -hmm. that discussion we had with the board for the sales tax fair. Right. Yeah, we have that sales tax. Something had to go with it capital budget and if you add that back something else has to go to the capital budget. Yeah. So even though we see you know, the need for it and desire for it there's not money for it. Maybe we could wait which is the neediest the 12th grade or the 3rd grade. Well the problem is, is that you have <coughs> curriculum adoption at the 12th grade level that requires having right. to have them so that's the other problem that they've been under because yeah. Now our entire high school social studies curriculum is digital. Yeah, it's there a problem a because unlike middle school, we have mixed grades in classes at high school, certainly as you're aware. And so it's been a little problematic because uh, every student hasn't had a, a device. So that should be rectified this coming year, but certainly conversation we can, um, we can continue having. Uh, considerations for sustaining, we've already said it's kind of expensive. Uh, determine if classroom devices can be provided for gate, lower grades in the future. And then the replacement of de devices that we have out there. And so I will remind you as part of our capital, five year capital budget uh, projection plan, we do have replacement beginning this school year for some of those devices that were purchased earlier. We have an aging fleet. That we do. Yep. Some of the one-to-one -one devices for the iPads. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just give you an example, and again, um, kind of pains me to talk about it, but Apple 4s, which is what we bought a lot of in the beginning because that's what was there, uh, can't take the latest iOS upgrade. And so they're still functional for a while, but you know, sooner or later they're going to be obsolete. So. And those are, those are how old? Uh, they were purchased in 2013, so they're about four or five years old at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can we give those to our kindergartners? Very well. Okay. It's a good possibility. A yep. Good possibility because they'll be using them differently than our yes. secondary school. Now, and they could use them as class sets as a Exactly. Yep. Right. And that will remind you again what's driving this is our kind of digital curriculum. And so I thought it would be interesting for you to see what curriculum we're using right now in our schools that's 100% digital. It's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. So right now, K-5 uh, music, Quavar's Marvelous World of Music, they love it. If you haven't uh, talked to them or heard your feedback, absolutely love it. Uh, social studies at fourth and fifth grade, 100% digital. Uh, why there? Because they have the devices in those classrooms. So. Um, social studies at the middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, 100% digital, and then one class at the high school um, is 100% digital, world cultural geography. Does that change in the coming years? Was for some reason I thought they were at 10th grade, it was to, where's Mr. Orwell? Yes. Is 10th grade change for that curriculum for social studies? I didn't know if those were, I thought those were going digital as well. They had digital. It's mixed, but it's not 100%. Okay. Yeah. They have both. It's mixed. Yeah. Okay, but it's not the 
Yeah. But now we no longer require that world cultural geography, right? It's for graduation. Is that right? Yeah, it's no longer required. But all schools are still offering it. All right. So I think one of the points I would like to try to make with this slide is there are some areas in our school district that are 100% digital. I was having a conversation earlier with someone outside of this meeting. I don't know that our immediate goal should ever be 100% digital across the board. We're in a good place right now to get some mastery, to get some comfort, to get some you know, vision for how this works and kind of get a feel for it and then kind of move forward you know, as we're able to. So, um, and even at this level, which you could almost consider a relatively low level of 100% digital, it's painful for some teachers, let's be honest. You know, you've heard some of you heard some feedback from some teachers. So um, that's where we're at. I think we're in a good place, you know, we're making progress. I think that positions like our instructor technology TOSIS can't do anything but help teachers become more comfortable, you know, using technology in their classroom. Now Digital curriculum uh, leads to a conversation about publisher uh, <coughs> curriculum systems. And so I can tell you this, as the instructional materials administrator in our school district, every textbook we adopt, every curriculum um, subject area we adopt has a heavy digital piece now. And so I want you to think about, there's five of the big publishers on that screen, think about this with me. Every one of those systems requires populating with student, teacher, class information. It requires keeping that up to date when the kid moves from school A to school B. It requires an individual student login, requires a unique username and password, and so potentially, as I say there, a student can have four or five username password combinations to remember. That's pretty crazy, you know, and kind of unrealistic. And so this year, we've gone to great lengths to kind of address that. And I want to show you this slide. So basically, these are all the publisher systems you know, I just described to you. And so in this model, which has not been painless to uh, implement, by the way, but we're about 90 to 95% there, on a nightly basis, these um, information systems are updated automatically from Skyward. Unbelievable. No human intervention, you know. Now, it requires setting up and a lot of the publisher systems, even though they're supposed to use the same standard called one roster, they're not the same, so there's some customization. But we're pretty much automated on this process. So, I was going to say Johnny, but that's a girl. So Susie now gets on her computer she has one username and password that's provided to her by the district. She logs into what's called Stoneware. It's a single sign-on computer system. She gets kind of like a dashboard of all the curriculum materials that she needs to access for her work from home or from school. That's pretty cool, you know, very cool. And so, again, it's not 100% there, but it's probably 95% there. I do want to give Jim Kelly on my staff a lot of credit for working on this since the last, you know, the end of this past school year. And it's, again, not been a painless process, but it's a very cool process. Can you see that? I'll go back one more slide. All that stuff is now... It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of... Because um, it includes their email, it includes their Skyward, all of that in one place, and, uh, and also, it was not an easy thing to take. Not an easy thing. I also want to give some credit to uh, Mr. Chamberlain and his staff, Kathy, and uh, others there to, that have been working with us on that, on that process. That's a big thing, and, and I know you may or may not even be, be aware of it, but this has been a big project for, for my department. Now, I only got two or three slides left. I don't think I'm right on time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, <laughs> digital, classroom, this digital classroom plan. In the past, uh, the state had pages of language related to the digital classroom plan. Well, with legislation passed this past year, they streamlined that down to about two or three paragraphs. And so basically, I've underlined the key phrases. Uh, digital classrooms plan allocation, Mr. Kennedy alluded to this earlier, 
acquiring and maintaining the items on the eligible services list for e-rating. So basically, uh, telecommunications, um, that kind of thing. Computer and device hardware, that's pretty straightforward. Professional development. And so year to date this year, they've not even given us a template or any kind of expectations. I say they, I mean Department of Education for a digital classrooms plan. So we're not sure where that's going, but I wanted to share with you, we've got funded $734,000 for 17-18. And so this slide breaks that down, how, how it's being used. So bandwidth increases, 90,000, you heard about some of those. Um, performance matters, this is where we pay for the two tech doses you just heard from, as well as a couple folks on my staff. We pay for Plato, Admin, subs, uh, training that relates to that um, professional development component. AirWatch is our mobile device management system that we use to manage 12,500 iPads we have out there and some other things, computers, iPads. You have $40, I think. I sure do, don't I? <laughs> Just checking. Yeah, I sure do. And now, if they had not passed, if they had passed what was originally proposed, um, which is why I talk about the five hundred thousand dollar minimum to each county. If that had gone to two fifty, the net result to us was about one hundred and fifty thousand less in funding. That would have impacted us. So it would have clearly had an impact on those. Any questions? Thank you. I'm always available if you have either call or drop by. And, uh, Thank you, sir. We appreciate and it. For the board to know that was Dr. Geddes's last state of the district because. Well, our dear friend is going to be retiring next year. I was hoping maybe that wouldn't come up. <laughs> it's sad for me, but yeah, possibly. We'll, we'll have time to say goodbye, but thank you, Dr. Geddes. All right, Ms. Crow, do we have two more things? Student services and then ESE. All right, we need a break from one o'clock, and then we'll, then we'll continue on. Okay.